Good morning, guys. For those of you who may be new here this week, my name is Cameron Schweitzer, and I have the pleasure of serving you all as a sort of interim preacher until you guys find your next English pastor. And maybe after today, you're going to be praying, God, please let that come quickly. Can't come quick enough. Uh, I also have the pleasure of serving at Gateway Seminary as the director of our campus here in Fremont. But it's my great joy to come and to share the word with you all as we learn to exalt God together through Christ. So that being said, guys, let's join together in a word of prayer as we ask our God to come and to move vitally here in this time of the word. Our great God, oh, how we pray even as we sung, that you, O Lord, would be all. Lord, we long for you to be the center of this church. We long for you to be the center of our lives. Oh God, even as we long for you to be the center of our culture and the center of the world. Our Lord, we thank you that through your word, you promise us that though it does not seem like it now, one day every knee will bow to you and confess you as Lord and as Savior. People from every tribe and tongue and nation will praise you, O God, through the Lamb and the power of the Spirit. O Lord, and how we pray that that day would come quickly. But Lord, that day is not yet. Lord, but this is the day that you have made, and you call us to rejoice and to be glad in O Lord. So we pray that we would. We pray that we'd be glad in you and in your word as we hear it spoken. Lord, we pray that your word would move mightily as we look to be a people who are united in the Spirit through the bond of peace. Lord, we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart to see the beauty of Jesus and the power of his gospel and its transforming power to tear down walls of hostility that naturally separate men from men. Lord, I pray for myself that you'd give me the words that I need to encourage and to build up this church, that I would decrease and that you'd increase, and that the voice that these young men and women hear would be the voice of their Savior calling to them through this humble vessel. Lord, we pray that you would build your church this morning. We're thankful that through your word you promise to do so. We pray this through Christ. Amen. The wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes is timeless. For Ecclesiastes' message is timeless and true. For it says in chapter 1, Generations come and generations go. But the earth remains the same forever. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. For there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can look at and say, look, something new. It was already here long ago. It was before our time. It's timelessly wise, friends. For the news that currently fills up our screens of the tension and hostility we are currently witnessing in Israel, the West Bank, in Gaza, this is not new. The brutality, the senseless evil, the cultural pride and religious racism in our day and our time is not a thing for which any of us can look at and say, look, something new under the sun. For the innocent Jewish blood, and that blood is innocent, that runs crimson under our sun, has shown ruby red before. It too spilt by Gentiles' intent on Jewish people's destruction. Hamas's deep-seated hatred of the Jews is not new. Jews avenging their blood by spilling their enemies' blood is not new either. The hostility between Jew and Gentile friends is not new. The violent animosity is as old as the distinction between Jew and Gentile itself. For a moment, listen to the Jewish historian Josephus as he described the violence and animosity between the Jews and Gentiles of Caesarea in the first century. And as you hear this, it may sound to you as if it's but describing the events transpiring between Hamas and Israel in our own day. He says this, Now the people of Caesarea had slain the Jews that were among them senselessly on the Sabbath day on which days the Jews have a respite from their works on account of divine worship. Which one would think must have come to pass by the direction of providence, insomuch that in one hour's time 
about 20,000 Jews were slaughtered. And all of Caesarea was emptied of its Jewish inhabitants. Upon which stroke that the Jews received there, the whole nation was greatly enraged. So they divided themselves into several parties and laid waste the villages of the Syrians and all their neighboring cities. And after them, Gadara and Hippos, and falling upon Galatinus, some cities they destroyed there as well, and they set on fire. And then they went to Cadessa, belonging to the Tyrians, and to Ptolemas, and to Gaba, and to Caesarea. Nor was either Sebast or Ascalon able to oppose the violence of the Jews with which they attacked. And when the Jews had burnt all these cities to the ground, they entirely demolished Gaza. Many also of the villages that were about every one of those cities were plundered, and an immense slaughter was made of the men who were caught in them. However, the Syrians got even with the Jews and the multitude of the men whom they slew, for they killed those whom they caught in the cities, and not only those in the cities, but those in the villages, to prevent the danger under which they themselves had come under, so that the disorders in all of Syria were terrible. And every city was divided, as it were, into two armies, Jew and non-Jew, and camped one against another. And the preservation of one party merely was found in the destruction of the other. So the daytime was spent in shedding blood, and the night was spent in fear. And listen to this. It was then common to see cities filled with dead bodies, still lying unburied, And those of old men and old women mixed with infants, all dead and scattered about naked together. Women also lay amongst them without any covering for their nakedness. You would then see the whole province full of inexpressible calamities, while the dread of still more barbarous practices, which were threatened everywhere, was greater than those which had already been perpetrated. So describes Josephus and his Jewish wars. In that time, and in that day, just as in our time, in our day, friends, Jews hated the Gentiles, even as the Gentiles hated the Jews, as we see in Josephus, even to the point of senseless murder. Now understand, this is the historical and cultural context in which we find the message of the Apostle Paul that we will be examining. This is the context in which Ephesians 2 was written when Paul speaks about Christ breaking down the walls of hostility. Friends, the hostility between Jews and Gentiles in the first century was great. For it was as if there was a dividing wall made up of their mutual hostility that has permanently divided these two groups, forever separating Jew from Gentile. So then understand, Paul's message of one new man in Christ, a man composed of both Jew and Gentile. That would have been a word which would have been very difficult for people in the first century to accept. Just as that word, if you were to preach this word today in a church in the Middle East, a church that's comprised of both Jew and Gentile, that would be a difficult word to hear for them. But, but, Paul told the Ephesian Christians, even as he informs our day and time, Christ is our peace. And Christ makes us one whether we want to be one with our neighbors or not. As he says in another place, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, circumcised nor uncircumcised, but Christ is is all and in all. So friends, Paul's word of peace and unity is one which our time desperately needs to hear. Even as it was a word that the Jews and the Gentiles of Paul's day in Caesarea Philippi and in Ephesus needed to hear as well. So then, Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 as we look to assert, rather, to have God assert his authoritative word for our time. We'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 2 and reading from verse 11 down through verse 22. 
And Paul says this, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were a stranger to the covenants of promise. You had no hope and were without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And Christ came and preached to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Now friends, this goes without saying, this is a dense passage. There is much rich theology within it. We do not, though, have the time this morning to go into depth into all of its facets and components to dig up, as it were, the gold in each of these verses. We have to content ourselves with an overview only of the important, pass- the, the important themes in this passage. We'll then summarize what we see and close with a bit of reflection of how these words, these key themes and ideas ought to shape and inform our living as a church together. Now, friends, there are three themes in this passage that I would like for us to focus on this morning. Three key themes that define the essence of Paul's countercultural message. First is his description of the divisions and the hostility between Jews and Gentiles. The first are the descriptions he provides of the hostility and the divisions between Jew and Gentile. Second, We want to look at Paul's unique depiction of Christ's work on the cross. Second, we'll be looking at the unique way that Paul describes Jesus' victory on the cross and how that applies to the divisions of Jews and Gentiles. Third, we will then speak of Paul's description of the peace and unity that flow forth as the effects of Christ's cross upon Jew and Gentile. Those are the three themes we want to look at this morning. So then let us first examine Paul's description of the divisions and the hostility between Jew and Gentile. We will describe seven points of division that Paul notes in that text, and then we're going to discuss that statement, that very important statement of what it means that there is a dividing wall of hostility that separated Jew from Gentile, which Jesus, Paul says, broke down. So let's look at those descriptions of the divisions between Jew and Gentile. So Paul describes, as you notice in the text, the Gentiles, people like us, unless there's any Jews in this room, who in the flesh are uncircumcised. We do not bear in our body the mark of Abraham that set Israel apart from all the nations. We are not natively God's people as it regards our flesh, nor are we, like Israel, descendants of Abraham who bore God's set-apart mark that would show that we were the people of God whose descendants and whose descendants' descendants were the Lord's property. Because of the Gentile, our uncircumcised state, Paul then heaps seven descriptions of our plight, of why we were so lost before Christ came into the world. So first, Paul states, we Gentiles in the flesh, uncircumcised, were separated from Christ. That is, we did not know of the Christ 
prior to his advent, as the Jews did. Nor, like the Jews, could we Gentiles claim that we had an organic connection to the Messiah who would come from our tribe. For it was the Jews alone whose lineage would link with Jesus, the Messiah. They could claim that God's Savior would arise from their people. He would bear their skin and be filled with their blood. We could not. Second, Paul says, we Gentiles were alienated from Israel's commonwealth. That is, we Gentiles did not get to live in God's land under God's rule, enjoying God's blessing. There was no Gentile nation like Israel that could claim as they could that God had formed them as a people. He redeemed them from slavery. He planted them in a land, gave them a law, and ruled over them as their king. None of us as Gentiles could have ever claimed before Christ, as any Israelite could, that God dwelled in our people's midst, that he walked among us, as he said. And that is what set apart Israel's commonwealth from all the nations. The Lord Almighty dwelled like a consuming fire within their borders. And thus Israel was, as it were, a light in the darkness shining to all the nations. Third, Paul says, we Gentiles, we were strangers to the covenants of promise. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. That is, friends, we did not know nor receive God's covenant promises to our forefathers before Christ's advent, as did the patriarchs of Israel. Friends, our ancestors were not told that their descendants would number as the sand on the seashore. Gentiles were not promised to dwell in a special land with God. Gentiles were not promised that their descendants would be God's mean to bless all the nations. Gentiles did not receive a promise that one from their people would always dwell upon the throne as king. Gentiles were not promised that they would always have a priest who would intercede between them and with God. Gentiles were not promised that they would be given always prophetic words of correction, direction, and illumination to their descendants. Gentiles, unlike the Jews, were not given a promise that despite your sinful rebellion, God would gather you to himself once more. He would put you in the land again, and he would give you a circumcised heart that would obey him joyfully. Friends, before Jesus' appearing, these promises were only the inheritance of Israel and no other nation. The Gentile nations were strangers to these covenant promises. Fourth, Paul then uses spatial language to state that Gentiles were far off from God. Gentiles were far off from the promised land of Israel. They were outsiders. We were outsiders. We were locked outside of God's sacred space. We were far off from the temple, far off from the law, far off from that land of blessing. Gentiles were far off from all the good and gracious gifts that God had given to Israel. We were as far off from that land as the east is as far from the west. So, Paul says, fifth, we were strangers and aliens. We were unknown to God, and God was unknown to us. The God of the Hebrews was estranged from us, and us from God. We were not close to God. We were not his chosen people. We were held at arm's length, as any stranger would be held at arm's length by a family who loves their own. We were alien to everything Jewish. God did not give any Gentile nation a natural claim or right to a land or to its promises, or to its law, or to its king, as any nation would give to a person who is an alien within its own borders. We were foreigners to God, to his people, and to his land. So Paul concludes, in view of such things, for the Gentiles before Christ came, we had no hope. We were without God in the world. For we had no promises. No divine presence, no savior, no lineage, no land, no law, no forgiveness, no temples, no priesthood, no sacrifices, no king. We had nothing. And any God which one of our ancestors worshipped was not a God at all. It was a God of their own making, at best. Or it was a demon of the darkness whom they bowed down to at worst. Therefore, our ancestors had no hope. 
Gentiles were lost in a sea of darkness, thrown about as it were on the ways of chance and time. Paul says then, these seven descriptions summarizes our account of our ancestors before Christ's appearing. The Jews, though, in this text, are on the other side of that dividing line. Because as you would look in this text and see the Jews, they were circumcised in the flesh. The Jews were near to God. The Jews got to enjoy God's presence in the Holy Land. They were united to the Christ by promise and by lineage. They were part of God's commonwealth. The Jews were the inheritors of all the covenants of promise. Jews were accounted as God's beloved children and accounted as his friends. They were citizens of that holy nation. So the Jewish people, unlike any Gentiles of old, had God and they had hope. So friends, Paul's point is clear. Before Christ, there were two groups of people, Jew and Gentile. That was the starkest division that could ever divide between two divisible peoples. For it was as if one was darkness and the other was light. One was day, one was night, one was straight, one was crooked, one was living, one was dying, one was oil, and one was water. They were forever separated, as it were, by this dividing line of the haves and the have-nots. And beyond these seven descriptions, though, of the religious division, of the cultural division between Jew and Gentile, Paul then speaks of a very tangible division between Jew and Gentile. A barrier which, until Christ's advent, would stand as a visible and a poignant reminder of the separation between Jew and Gentile. In verse 14, Paul refers to this barrier as a dividing wall of hostility. So you may be asking yourself, what does that refer to? Well, in the first century, Paul and his audience were well aware of the construction and the layout of Herod's second temple in Jerusalem. All across the known world, both Jew and Gentile accounted that temple in Jerusalem as one of the wonders of the world. All were impressed with its great stones. All were impressed by its marvelous architecture, which as we learn in the Gospel of John took nearly five decades to finish. And then once inside the larger confines of the temple compound, Gentile God-fearers were only allowed to be in the court of the Gentiles, the outermost court of the temple. They were not allowed to enter the inner confines of the temple's outer court, because this was only where ritually pure Jews were allowed to enter. And then within that, there was the inner court of the inner court to which only the priests could go, only the Levites. And then within that, the most sacred space of the temple mount is the place to which only the high priest could go, and that once a year on the Day of Atonement. But within those outer courts, there was a wall, a barrier that separated the Gentile court from the Jewish court. And understand, and you can see this in the book of Acts, that taking a non-Jew, a Gentile, into the court of the Jews was such a significant breach of Jewish law that even the Romans gave the Jewish authorities the right and the ability to execute violators of that law. It is then not without the threat of force that Jews place an inscription on the fence that separated one court from another, declaring that the Gentiles who passed through this barrier, the dividing wall, did so on pain of their own death. Listen to what the inscription said. No man or you could add a woman, of another race is to enter within this fence and enclosure around the temple. No one. Whoever is caught will only have himself to thank for the death which will follow. That barrier was the dividing wall of hostility that separated very physically and tangibly and visibly Jew from Gentile. And within the confines of those walls, there was also hostility within the hearts of the people that separated. For the Jews, as you know, as you read your Bible, were a very prejudiced and racist people. They hated the Gentiles. They did not want them in their midst, and I'm sure they wished that God would but destroy all the Gentiles and not let them into that court. 
even as the Gentiles would be outside that wall, filled with hostility in their heart, arising from this deep-seated jealousy that just wanted to be on the other side. For I'm sure many Gentiles thought, oh, that I might just get over the wall, that I could join the Jews and worship and commune with the living God as they do. A dividing wall stood to remind both parties who was near and who was far, who was chosen who was passed over, who was alien, who was citizen, who was stranger, who was friend, who had the law, who did not have the law, who had the promises, who did not have the promise, who had God and hope, and who did not. There was a dividing wall, a physical barrier filled with hostility that remained fixed and immovable that would remind every Jew and every Gentile, this is where you belong. Paul says, though, but now. But now God has done a new thing in Christ. For Jesus is tearing down the barriers that have separated Jew from Gentile. And this is the second theme we want to see within this passage. Namely, Paul's unique depiction of Christ's work on the cross. Now again, listen to what Paul says. But now in Jesus, you who are once far off, you've been brought near by Jesus' blood. For he himself is our peace, and he has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He has done this by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility. Friends, according to Paul, Christ accomplished many significant things through the cross. Did he not? In this text, there are eight things that Paul says Jesus did. The first and a second accomplishments to note are connected. It's this. Namely, his cross, his cross killed the hostility between Jew and Gentile. His cross killed the hostility And his cross broke down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that separated the two parties. Friends, on the cross, Christ killed the hostility between Jew and Gentile, which had formerly led to the killing of the other. Through his work on the cross, Paul notes, Jesus, as we read of in other places, not only propitiated God's righteous wrath against us, against our sin, killing the hostility between God and man through his being killed by man. But, in this text, Paul adds, Jesus also propitiates the anger between two parties through angry men's killing of him. Christ's work on the cross, Paul says, has propitiated and put to rest all anger between God and men and men with men. In this text, so the primary focus that Paul is getting at is this propitiating of the anger, the hostility between Jew and Gentile through the cross. His cross did this, as Paul says, by breaking down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So just as we read of in the Gospels that Christ tore apart the veil that separated God from man in the Holy of Holies, which was a symbolic statement of man's separation from his creator. So too, Paul adds, Jesus broke down metaphorically the wall of hostility that separated the Jewish court from the Gentile court in the temple. The dividing line that separated the chosen race from the passed over races, Christ has broken down through his body. So then no longer could one race of men claim special privilege over other races of men. There would no longer be a division between Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised. For in Christ, Paul says, all those who are of faith are of the sons and daughters of Abraham. Further, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, but Christ is all. And in all, as he says in Romans 2, there is no one who is a Jew who is merely one outwardly nor a circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. 
and in the first century, God in his sovereignty sealed the truth of the destruction of the dividing wall of hostility. For not too many years after Paul wrote these words in Ephesians, for those of you who know your history, in AD 70, God allowed the Romans to come into Jerusalem and flatten the temple. It was gone. As Jesus says, there would not be one of these stones left unturned. Now, all men, both Jew and Gentile, though, through Christ could come to God in spirit and in truth and worship God freely through the true temple, Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus broke down this ceremonial dividing wall of hostility, Paul says. He did it by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, I don't have time to detail the nuance and multifaceted way in which Christ both fulfills and annuls Israel's laws. That would require an entire message of its own. But what I can do is follow Paul's train of thought, and it's this, that there are large sections of the Mosaic law that deal with what you could call ceremonial ordinances. That is, those laws that pertain to how Jews were to approach the Lord and fellowship with him in their temple, that they might be holy and clean and acceptable. But these same laws, the Jews had taken to unbiblical extremes to literally fence out the Gentiles from having access to God. These ordinances, Paul says, of how one was to access God appropriately, cleanly, and in a holy manner, Christ's work on the cross abolished. For through him, all men can worship and fellowship with God the Father in the Spirit of truth. Jews no longer had the exclusive privilege of doing so through following those laws, those ordinances. Christ's cross rendered all of those things obsolete. He tore down that dividing wall that expressed those ordinances. For as Paul says, Christ is our peace. He is the peace of both Jew and Gentile. He is both our peace with God and our peace with one another. And then the remaining descriptions of what Jesus' cross has accomplished flow forth from this reality. Christ's blood, he says, brings near the Gentiles who are far off. It brings them near to both God and to Jew. Christ has now made Gentiles part of his family. So there's no longer Jew and Gentile in Christ, for his body is made up of both of them, in him in oneness. For he is created in himself in view of his hostility destroying cross, as it says in the text, one new man in place of the two. And this one new man in Christ is a man of peace that Christ has formed. Whereas there were formerly two kinds of men, Jew and Gentile, that were always embroiled in hostility. Now, though, through the cross, Christ reconciles both Jew and Gentile together to God in one body, his body, where this one new man is found. Christ's cross has done a wonderful thing, has it not? Then Paul goes on to develop the third theme in this passage of the unity and peace that's affected between Jew and Gentile. And what he goes on to say is merely a further elaboration of what we see Christ's cross having accomplished. But again, listen to how Paul summarizes the effects of Gentile and Jewish unity in verse 17 to 22. He says this, and Christ came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So notice a few things. First, Paul says, Christ preaches to both Jew and Gentile. He preaches a word of peace to those who were near and those who were far. He preaches the same word of peace to both. There is no distinction. Men and women of all nations can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There is one mediator between all men and women and their creator, and it is the man, Christ Jesus. He is the way upon which all men, both Jew and Gentile, must walk to join the heavenly Father in his heavenly home. Both Jew and Gentile have access to the same Father in one spirit. There are not two words of peace. There are not two spirits. There are not two fathers. There is one word of peace, one spirit, and one father. And it is through this one spirit that all men and women must receive this one word of peace, receive it through faith, and have access to the father. This is the same word for both Jew and Gentile. So then Paul implies, Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens to Israel's commonwealth, to its covenants or its temple or its God. Far from it. Gentiles are now united to Jews through Christ, the one who preaches peace. And now Jew along with Gentile are all citizens and members of God's house. Gentiles, those like us, are now fused into Christ, the cornerstone, And just as the Jews share the same foundation of the prophet and the apostles, we all now come from the same stock and the same root. We are all now children of Abraham through faith. Furthermore, Paul notes, Gentiles are no longer on the other side of the dividing wall of hostility. Friends, we are no longer left out of the camp. Instead, in union with Jewish believers, united to the same Christ, Jew and Gentile, through the Spirit, are now being made up into the temple of the living God. Jew and Gentile are being built up through the same Spirit to be God's new, living, ever-expanding temple in Jesus Christ. Think of that. Gentiles were once locked out of the temple court, but now through Christ, Gentiles are living stones united to Christ, united to the Jews, and are now living in a living temple that's looking to fill and to expand into all the earth. And both Jew and Gentile are indwelled by the same spirit, making up the same temple, enjoying the same God's lovely presence. Friends, Christ has fashioned this new transpatial, transracial, ever-expanding living temple through his one new man that's formed in Jesus Christ. This is the work that Christ has done. What a great work that it is. So we could summarize what Jesus says, sorry, what Paul says in this way. Christ kills the hostility between peoples of different flesh through the killing of his flesh that we might all be one, new man of flesh in him, an ever-expanding living temple of the Most High God. So what Paul is teaching us here, that Christ kills the hostility between peoples of different flesh through the killing of his flesh, that we might be all one new man of flesh growing and expanding as a living temple of the Most High God. Now I'd like to close with two points of application I'd like for us to observe in view of Christ's work of uniting people through the cross. First, as Paul commends, commands rather the Ephesians in chapter 4, I urge you, even as I command you all, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who is all and through all in all. Friends, as a church... In view of Christ's uniting cross, in view of the oneness that you have with one another and with God, you must strive to make more real the unity that you already have in Christ. You must live out the reality of the unity in practice that God has already achieved for you in Christ. Do not allow any root of bitterness to spring up amongst this fellowship of love and unity that you in fact share. Think and act in such a way that you work for unity and not disunity. What this would mean then is you would put others before yourself. You would think of others' interests as more significant than your own. You would not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But you would consider others as more significant, more important than yourselves. This is the kind of love that our Savior 
has shown us and says we ought to show one another. Love, as Jesus tells us, knows no greater love than this, that one would lay their life down for their brother. So friend, might you be willing to die every day in this church to your own interests, to your own wishes, that you might exalt the interests and wishes of another? If this church could achieve such a servant-like heart, what a united fellowship it would be. For this church would be defined by love and joy, not hostility and animosity. For hostility and animosity only spring up when they're rooted in arrogance and pride. And they're the fruit of ugly hearts that love to focus on themselves. But instead of focusing on yourself, might you learn to focus on God and Christ in this church, even as you already do. Focus on worshiping the Lord and Savior Christ in spirit and in truth, rather than worshiping and making your own interests an object of your adoration. Well, you're desirous of preserving your own preferences, your own honor, your own wishes. To do the former is to focus on that which unites, but to do the latter is to focus on that which divides. And friends, remember that unity necessitates that differences remain. Otherwise, it is not unity, but sameness or uniformity that you are pursuing. So we should learn to celebrate and champion other people's differences, different gifts, different dispositions, different personalities, different ways of viewing the world, and relish in the diversity of this body. For you ought not to be creating a culture of sameness. That would be like a gray, suffocating blanket. But you should be looking to cultivate and weave a tapestry that's bound together with beautiful colors in the same spirit. Friends, unity in Christ celebrates differences. It embraces them willingly as it joyfully puts others before themselves. Second, be aware that God does not show favoritism. And so we should not either. You then should heed James's word about favoritism. For to show favoritism rends apart the united body of Christ. My brothers, Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus. Show no partiality. If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. There are many things, especially for those who are young, to which you like to show favoritism. Many people that you like to be attached to, whether it's about money or status or popularity or good looks or what have you, but we only show favoritism because of what it does for us, not what it does for the other, because we love to be esteemed and honored when we're attached to a person who we show favoritism to because we get exalted along with them a bit. So friends, do not be so self-centered to show favoritism. Instead, be other-centered and render to all men and women the equal dignity and honor to whom it is due. For when you act like that, that's how you work for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Friends, remember that Christ kills the hostilities between different peoples through the killing of his flesh. Might we too be willing to kill the hostilities within our own flesh? that we might be united in love and in joy to others. Pray with me that we might be the case. Our God, we thank you for your grace and for the transformative word of Christ. We pray, O Lord, that you'd make us people who are united in the bond of spirit and the unity of peace. I pray that you would be all in all in this church, that you would tear down any hostile walls that might be found. O Lord, glorify your name in this church as you work for greater and greater unity until you are all in all. God, might you do this for your glory, for the joy of this people, and for the good of this city. Amen.